I'm going to introduce uh, the, our, the people that are going to give us an opening here this morning. So we're going to hear first from Reverend Jody Sparger with the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada, uh, the founder and lead trainer at the Healing at the Wounded Place, and also Shannon Perez of the Deasy Dene First Nation and Canadian Ministries Justice and Reconciliation Mobilizer with the Christian Reformed Church of North America. And uh, Shannon and Jody will do an opening for us this morning, this evening. So I'm going to give it over to them. Thank you. My name is Shannon Pettis. I am Saizi Dene First Nation. The place I call home is Winnipeg, Treaty 1 territory on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation. Welcome. And my name is Jody Sparger. My great-grandparents uh, were settlers. I am a settler. <laughs> My great-grandparents uh, came from Germany and Finland and Sweden. And I'm joining you from the west coast here, the unceded territory of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples, also known as Vancouver, British Columbia. We are grateful that so many are with us. Um, and uh, as was invited a couple of moments ago, if you're just joining us now, we want you to just take a moment to uh, acknowledge where you are, the territory that you are participating from. In order to prepare ourselves uh, to hear from the panelists this evening, we wanted to invite you to enter into prayer in dialogue with the principles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And to begin, I wanna invite you all to just take a deep breath right where you are. And then see if you can find your heartbeat. I'd invite you to, um, to drum maybe on your chest or somewhere on your body, the rhythm of your heartbeat. As you do this, I want to invite you to simply hold in the presence of God, the Creator, those individuals whose basic human rights are not observed or respected, and that you would echo their heartbeats in your own. And let us begin our, our prayer. Creator, we come and give thanks for this day. We have thankful hearts for our allies, friends, and supporters here today, understanding that we all have inherent rights as humans in you, Creator. All of us understand how important implementing Bill C-15 is. Great Spirit, bless us with your gifts of courage, strength, humility, and love as we seek to work together in this ever-changing world of COVID-19 creating vibrant communities across Canada. Our prayer is the words of the late Chief Joseph of the Nays Purse people who called for rights to be a free man, to travel, to work, to follow his own teachings and religion, to think and act for himself, to the current prayers and efforts at implementing legislation for our laws to be consistent and respectful with the declaration. Creator, grant us resiliency, and we pray for the urgency to implement Bill C-15. We reject settler myths that have obscured the harm and the violence perpetrated against Indigenous peoples in this land. Perpetrated by the state, by our churches and institutions, by us as individuals. We reject the principles of white supremacy that are quick to protect the status quo and slow to seek justice when it is not perceived as serving us. God, forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. We ask creator for continued health to those who are struggling because of COVID-19, for justice of the indigenous women and girls missing and murdered and their families. Help us to celebrate advocates and allies who have passed on leaving their legacy of fighting for justice. We pray for the healing and flourishing of Indigenous families as we seek to change the colonial systems that continue to destroy Indigenous families. When we grow af afraid or weary on this journey, 
May we ask for strength to carry on. If your eyes aren't already open, I would invite you to uh, open them now. And in this final portion of our prayer together, we want to invite you to pray with us in an embodied way. Shannon holds the smudge bowl uh, on behalf of all of us. As we prepare to listen tonight, Creator, would you open our eyes? And I'd invite you to just simply place your hands on your eyes. Would you open our ears? Would you open our hearts? And having heard the things that are before us, would you open our mouths to bear witness to what we have heard? Would you animate our whole bodies head to toe and place us on the path to walk together in a good way? In the name of Jesus, the way maker, all my relations. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you to Jody and Shannon um, for getting us going in a good way. Um, we're going to get ourselves started here this evening, and for those of you who have just joined, just letting you know that we do have French interpretation. Um, and we do have also just to let people know, because this event had uh, more than a thousand people register for it, well, we have elected to not have the chat open to everyone because frankly, we won't be able to keep track of chatting with a thousand people. Um, so, um, I am just going to get us started. I'm not sure if Chief Little Child has joined yet or not. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed on that one. Um, but I'm going to get us started anyways. We do, um, uh, it's a great privilege for me to be able to introduce our speakers for the evening. And hopefully our third speaker will be with us by the time we are uh, ready for him. So I will just say again that this evening's event is being hosted by an ad hoc ecumenical group called Faith in the Declaration. And it came about with many different national faith houses and organizations that have been working together to support the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, some of us worked together on Bill C-262, and uh, now we are working on support for Bill C-15. We do have a website, and I believe that link is up. Um, the website is faithinthedeclaration.ca, where you'll find a lot of resources around uh, educational resources around the declaration itself, as well as on C-15. So um, that's, that's who's bringing you the evening. So it's a deep privilege for me to introduce our speakers. This evening, we have the Honorable Marie Sinclair, we have Dr. Marie Wilson, and I sincerely hope that in the next few minutes, we will also have uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild. So I'm going to start with just giving some very brief bios, although frankly, I'm sure that um, these speakers need no introduction, but I will give very brief bios uh, for the three of them before we get started. So the Honorable Marie Sinclair is an Anishinaabe and a member of the Peguis First Nation. He's a fourth degree chief of the Midwin Society, a traditional healing and spiritual society of Anishinaabe Nation, responsible for protecting the teachings, ceremonies, laws, and history of the Anishinaabe. He graduated from law school in 1979, and he was the first Indigenous judge appointed in Manitoba and Canada's second. He served as chair of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He retired from the bench and was appointed to the Senate in 2016. And he retired from the Senate earlier this year and has just most recently, um, I believe last week, been named as the new chancellor for Queen's University in Ontario. Dr. Marie Wilson, a commissioner with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is an award-winning journalist and trainer, as well as a federal and territorial executive manager. She's also been a high school teacher in Africa, a university lecturer, as well as a consultant. 
She's fluently bilingual in French and English and a prominent public speaker throughout Canada and internationally on the successes and challenges of advancing reconciliation. I have to say that Marie gave me a wonderful teaching several years ago, she probably doesn't remember, I was with her and Romeo Saganash on uh, talking about the role that ignorance plays in racism. And our third speaker I, is Chief Wilton Willie Littlechild, who was the first treaty Indian in Alberta to graduate with a law degree and is a former member of parliament. He is also the former rapporteur of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and the former chair of the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Chief Littlechild first went to the UN in the 1970s and he has been a leader in the international indigenous movement for decades. He most recently serving on a steering committee for UNESCO for the International Year of Indigenous Languages. In addition to his international work, he's also been the chair of the Saskatchewan Justice Commission, a regional chief for Alberta, as well as a commissioner to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Chief Littlechild is also an avid sports person and throughout his lifetime, he has been a bull rider, a swimmer, and a hockey player. So, welcome to the commissioners. We are honored to have you here with us this evening. We were very active, many of us were very active in supporting Romeo Saganash's private members bill. And now we are working on support around Bill C-15. And I think we're gonna go ahead and begin our conversation um, and hopefully, we will have Chief Littlechild join us um, uh, at some point. I spoke with him earlier today, so I think that he has just been um, tied up, but hopefully he will be joined. Oh, I just saw him arriving. So Jonathan, uh, we'll need to make sure you've got his mic turned on. His entry is under Wilton's iPad. Talk about making an entrance. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're, you're not even aware of half of it. We're so used to, we're so used to it. That <laughs> I'm sure his colleagues could share stories about that. So, uh, Chief Littlechild, do we have you here? He has, he has on occasion, incidentally, shown up on the back of a horse. So, so you know that. Right? So we better check and see if he is. We thought of, we thought about um, publishing a board, new board game called "Where's Willie." It was a very <laughs> long pressure that we had. Uh, I won't tell you about the day we that he got lost and we couldn't find him in the Empress Hotel in Victoria, BC. <laughs> is he there somewhere? I, I, he I don't... is there. He's just <laughs> is, uh, he's just needs to unmute himself. Mute, Willie. I mute. see him. Willie, we just need you to unmute. And then we'll get a spotlight shown on you as well. Willie, you've missed the introductions. I've already read your bio. You don't know what I said. And we will leave it forevermore to say that I said good things about you. Um, <laughs> as opposed to what we said. <laughs> I noticed you said it. There he is. Can we... I noticed, just I get noticed you said something twice. We want to just get a spotlight on Wilton's iPad. Oh, there he is. All and right. See him too. <clears throat> Here we go. That's excellent. Well, we're not going to swap stories about arriving on horseback and getting lost in hotels, but because this is virtual, he didn't have a choice about coming in on a horse, but I can absolutely well imagine it. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to all of our three commissioners. We are really beyond honored that you accepted our invitation to come this evening. It is, gives us such great, great pleasure to have the three of you. And I think I can probably speak for all of the many hundreds of people that are watching us, um, that the three of you and your work have inspired us all deeply and greatly and uh, it is such an honor for us to have you here this evening. So we are hoping uh, to make this, we didn't want to make this uh, your typical webinar with lengthy presentations. We wanted to make this more of a dialogue between the commissioners. Um, we would like to hear about you uh, from each of you, each of the three of you on how your thoughts on the relationship between the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and how that now brings us to this moment uh, with Bill C-15. And we are, for those who don't follow the parliamentary calendar on an almost hourly basis, um, we are on the cusp of Bill C-15 moving from the House of Commons um, into the Senate. That qu hasn't quite happened yet, although the Senate has begun a pre-study of their work uh, and their pre-study of the legislation I think is going to begin this week. So we very much would like to hear from the three of you on how uh, is, is, do you or do you not see C-15 as an extension of your work um, that began with the TRC and why legislation for the UN Declaration is so important. So I am going to actually, even though he was the last to join, uh, Chief Little Child is the member of our team here tonight that has had the long history with the UN Declaration. So, um, Willie, if it's all right with you, I was going to ask you to go first, but I will uh, absolutely allow you to defer to your colleagues if you wanted another minute to get yourself settled. Well, I can go. Okay, I'm excellent. Ready. I'll hand the mic to you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay then? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? 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 Can you hear all of you in my Greek Cree language, and to give thanks to Great Spirit or God, however you acknowledge our Creator, for yet another great blessing today. I introduced myself in my Cree name, Walking Wolf, and to my colleagues who through our journey um, came to be a brother and sister for me. Many times I used an illustration of walking along a railway track to describe our court ordered mandate and how we could comply with the challenge put before us of finding the truth of the Indian residential school story. We were wisely guided by spiritual helpers throughout our search amid the 7,000 testimonies. What were the common threads or themes that were underpinned by the seven sacred teachings? Why did we decide early to search into the missing children that we were hearing about? Even though I spent 14 years in three residential schools, at what point could I say to myself, having heard both sides of what happened, having lived the experience, yes, this is the truth. So now what do we do with it? Because of a restricted mandate and in order to respect and honor the witnesses, it was hard to then jump from truth to reconciliation. What unfolded in front of us, especially in front of me, was that it was a spectrum. There were important elements of the complete history that we had to address if we were gonna establish a path to reconciliation. Indeed, what is, it, what is reconciliation? What does it look like? What does it feel like? So we took the 7,000 stories, and that's an average I'm using, to inform and describe reconciliation. Then we asked ourselves, what were the 10 main teachings? What what were the 10 common threads that weave the 10 principles of reconciliation? 
So throughout this journey, the six and a half years, I would say it's kind of like a river, I would say. We started back in 1923, searching for human rights to be applied to indigenous peace. 1948, when the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was adopted, we went there. It was not only until 1974 when people started questioning how come our relationship, our treaty relationship is being violated on a daily basis. So my elders asked me if I would go to the international arena to try and expose what was going on back home. And so now, after 27 years at the UN, working on the declaration, only to get it denied by Canada, then another 12 years to, so that we could get an endorsement and acceptance of Canada. And then finally, the adoption without qualification. But all through that river, of course, like any river, when you hit a rough spot like a rock, you just, the water seems to just keep going. So we did that. Now, personally, I see, yes, this is a continuation of that journey. C-15 hit a rock, a few rocks here and there. Before that, 262 hit some rocks and five other times before that. But here we are today, as you said, Jennifer, on the cusp of this long journey coming to the Senate <coughs> for final consideration to the point where we will hear those words soon of acceptance uh, by the Senate and the House of Commons. So it was a long river, it's a long journey, a lot of rough spots, but I think uh, there is that connection way back from when it started in 1923 till tonight. So thank you for this invitation to share those opening thoughts for myself. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Little Child. And uh, it's been such an honor and a pleasure for me over the past almost 25 years to have worked with you on the international stage and, and uh, <laughs> So much you've given to all of us doing that work. So second, I'm going to ask uh, the Honorable Murray Sinclair to give his uh, opening thoughts on the TRC and the declaration and bringing us now to this moment. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, um, uh, I'm just trying to organize my thinking here as, uh, as we begin uh, this dialogue. Uh, first of all, as I, as I usually do when I do my presentations, I just want to acknowledge the survivors um, who participated with us during the TRC and who um, came forward with their stories and shared so much and, and who contributed to uh, what I consider to be a a very influential report that uh, ultimately is going to change the way Canada sees itself and uh, moves forward. Um, I particularly would like to acknowledge the survivors who are no longer with us, uh, particularly those members of our survivor committee um, who advised us as we went along and uh, who are not with us. Um, and of course, uh, our staff, some of our staff are no longer with us too, because they have, uh, they have left us uh, uh, and gone on to the spirit world. Um, and I, I also just want to acknowledge all of those friends and supporters who um, encouraged us and worked with us and, and did what they could to um, inspire us to 
to keep doing this work. Uh, uh, we just recently lost uh, a very important one, and that was Tom Berger last week, and I uh, want to acknowledge him as well. Um, so um, <clears throat> I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time uh, going through what in the UN Declaration. I think that uh, all of those who are on this call have probably familiarized themselves with it. Um, uh, I will talk a little bit about the content of C15 because it's a bit different from the content of C26, C2, and um, I want to talk about that. Uh, and I, I do, though, just want to, um, to point out that uh, during the course of our work and, and afterwards, um, and during one of the presentations that I did, I, I, um, I often heard, um, I heard it less and less as we went along, but I often heard people who would say to me, and then often there are significant public figures who, who would say, uh, well, you know, it's reconciliation is for the Indians. They, they're the ones that have to get over this. They have to move on and reconciliation is for them to come to terms with this past. And that was a, a commonly held belief that, um, that the reconciliation was for the indigenous people, the survivors who went to the school to figure out how to come to terms with this experience. And, uh, and it uh, really betrayed a, uh, an ongoing ignorance about uh, what was in our report and what we talked about in our report. Uh, because uh, the uh, impact of residential schools was the main focus of what we talked about during the TRC and what was in our report. But we also outlined in our report the long history of uh, social, cultural, and legal oppression that uh, was uh, imposed upon Indigenous people from the time of Confederation going forward. <clears throat> and the outright racism that Indigenous people had to, had to put up with. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I've written a, a paper that shared it with senators in which I identified 28 different pieces of legislation um, because I wanted senators to know that the Senate itself is, uh, in, in, was not uh, innocent in the uh, issue of... Uh, the oppression of Indigenous people, because every single law that was passed in Canada, going back to the first Indian Act, um, and uh, detailing laws such as those that uh, took away the rights of Indigenous women, um, that interfered with Indigenous self-government, that uh, allowed Indigenous children to be taken away from their families and placed in schools, that uh, um, authorized the expenditure of large amounts of money for those schools, um, that took away the rights of Indigenous people to vote. Many people don't know that in 1885, uh, Indigenous people had the right to vote. Um, well, Indigenous men did, I should say, uh, as long as they qualified as other in non-Indigenous men did, and that is they owned property outside of their reserve. Um, but that was taken away in 1892. Uh, legislation was passed, which did away with the role of traditional councils and traditional chiefs and allowed the government to impose ban councils on Indigenous people. The uh, <clears throat> interference with trade, um, so Indigenous people who had very successful trading operations and farming operations um, uh, had their right to trade interfered with by the government and often prohibited by uh, local Indian agents. And uh, the Indian pass system was put in place, which said that Indigenous people could be detained by police if they left their communities without permission. Um, so there's a large number of Canadian laws that were passed, which uh, uh, the government used in order to oppress Indigenous people and take away their rights, to deny them justice. They couldn't go to court. They couldn't hire a lawyer. They couldn't get legal advice. Um, and even their non-Indigenous friends were prohibited from going to court and getting um, uh, lawyers to represent them um, unless the Minister of Indian Affairs gave his consent and that never happened. Um, and the consequences have been that uh, 
indigenous communities um, uh, have suffered. Uh, their self-determination uh, experiences were undermined totally. Their um, right to determine their own future was totally controlled by the government. Um, their ability to even raise their own children was taken away, um, not just by the residential schools, but uh, beginning in the 1950s, the government required all indigenous parents to transfer legal guardianship of their children to the government. Um, and, and this resulted in the 60s scoop, so that uh, huge numbers of children were transferred into provincial and territorial child welfare agencies uh, and taken away from parents. Um, and you, that's when we begin to see the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in the child welfare system. Over-incarceration rates are all attributable to this history. And, uh, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, was a, an effort by uh, the international community to call upon member nations to undo everything that they had done to reverse all of that legislation which they had in place that justified that or made that, all of that happen and to recognize that uh, systemically there are still some hidden defects in, in many laws that continued this, uh, this behavior uh, and, and this approach to things. Um, I often tell people uh, who are opposed to gun control legislation that the first people who were prohibited from carrying weapons in Canada were indigenous people back in the 1880s. Uh, and um, they did that even before there was a criminal code. Um, and so we now have situations where uh, seven or eight generations of children have gone through those schools and the children of those children who have gone through those schools are being raised in an environment in which their parents can't speak the language, can't teach them the language. The schools and their communities were prohibited from providing them with language services for the longest time uh, and uh, not allowed to educate them in accordance with their own cultural values and own cultural ways of doing things. And uh, the United Nations Declaration said to member nations, you have to stop doing that. And in addition to that, you have to uh, do what you can to help those communities of indigenous people who have been affected by those laws to begin to revive their cultures, to begin to revive their self-government, begin to revive their lifestyles and, um, and recognize that it's because of what you did, governments, that we have the situation not just in Canada, not just in the United States, but throughout the world with all indigenous communities for the most part. And, uh, and so there is a, there was a, a real growing need for that to, to happen. And Canada's lack of willingness to endorse um, the EU declaration uh, was not something that they alone were, were doing. It was also uh, the United States and Australia, three of the most um, significant um, countries in, in terms of their behavior towards Indigenous people uh, who, who benefited the most from their own legislative exploitation of Indigenous people. And so uh, the UN Declaration uh, basically says, now it's time to fix all of that. And uh, and what uh, we did in our report was we recognized that and we said that's an important element of reconciliation because um, reconciliation is not just for Indigenous people. It's not just for them to come to terms with this past, but Canada, Canadian society also has to recognize that they have contributed to this as well, not just in the way that it dealt with Indigenous kids in the residential schools, but also in the way that it dealt with non-Indigenous and Indigenous kids in the public schools. And uh, so now we need to begin to correct the, those, those pictures. And, and so when uh, Romeo Saganash first introduced uh, C-262 as a private member's bill, it was a significant advancement. Uh, but it, 
keep in mind that it came about only as a private member's bill. The government itself, even though they endorsed the UN declaration, they themselves did not take action to begin to change their laws, begin to recognize that even current existing laws still need to be changed. And, and uh, it's current existing laws that are interfering with all of those things that they were intended to interfere with going back uh, 130, 140, 150 years. And so uh, Romeo's bill made it through the House of Commons, not without the fight, um, made it into the Senate. And I was the sponsor of the bill when it came to the Senate. And every step of the way, it was opposed by uh, corporate interests and uh, who had the uh, support of the Conservative Party of Canada and the Conservative Party in the Senate uh, did all that they could to block the bill moving forward and successfully so because all they had to do was delay it and because they were the official opposition in the Senate they, they benefited from certain rules that they had put in place which allowed them as opposition to restrict uh, consideration in the Senate only to government bills. And that's one of the reasons why that bill never made it through the Senate was because they kept moving it off the agenda. And uh, the government would not pick it up and support it in the Senate, uh, despite the fact that we called upon them to do it, called upon them to, to be, uh, to honor the commitment that they had made to indigenous people and uh, much to my disappointment and the disappointment of many of you, um, it didn't pass. But this bill now is a government bill. And as a government bill, um, the opposition can't simply use rules to block it. They, uh, they're, they're trying to block it by overwhelming the committee that's going to be studying it in the Senate. Uh, they're calling upon um, the committee itself to spend weeks and weeks uh, hearing from witnesses uh, when normally a bill spends uh, two or three days just listening to witnesses. Um, but uh, this committee now has got a witness list that's well over 45 people. And, uh, and so that's um, being tolerated by the government and it shouldn't be, they should be exercising their legislative authority to ensure that while there are fair hearings given to the bill, that it is uh, processed through before this, this session ends and an election is called. Um, and my warning to the government before I left the Senate was that if you allow this bill to fail, uh, as you did the last bill, then you're going to have to face the wrath of not just the indigenous populations of Canada, but you'll have to face the wrath of all of Canada who are supportive of this bill. And supporters of uh, the legislation um, are, is quite uh, high. It's in the 60th percentile range. And so I say that um, the government needs to uh, push forward to make sure that this bill gets the attention that it deserves and uh, not just in terms of um, the public but in terms of their uh, authority to, to process it and get it through the, the Senate and, uh, and on for a vote. Um, opposition are also organizing uh, people, the public members of the public, particularly from the Indigenous community to speak out against C215 even though uh, 262 had the endorsement of virtually every single Indigenous uh, leader in Canada, including the chiefs, uh, but now they're speaking out against it, arguing, uh, and I think um, with the backing of uh, the petroleum industry and other industrial interests, arguing that uh, they have not been given the lead uh, on this bill, and, and that's uh, a silly position to take, quite frankly. Uh, because their consultation uh, took place well during 262's uh, debates as well. 
Uh, so let me say that uh, 215 itself, uh, sorry, Bill C-15 itself really does uh, one simple little thing, and that is it requires the government to analyze all of its legislation, identify those bills that need to be reviewed, replaced, amended, and then to do something about that and to report back to the House and to the Senate. It's, it's that simple. Um, it's not a complicated bill. It, uh, it recognizes the validity of the UN declaration, but the government of Canada has already done that. And it now says um, we are going to undertake a process of analysis. Quite frankly, they could have done that analysis without a, a piece of legislation. Uh, and, and again, I reminded them of that, that they should have been analyzing their legislation throughout. We did an analysis in my office uh, of legislation uh, during the, the debate on 262. And there are numerous bills that need to have amendments made. Um, uh, but they have to report back in a, a period of time. And the bill itself initially said three years. I think it was amended in committee to require a two-year reporting period, uh, but the, um, the bill itself is at risk uh, because uh, the opposition is marshalling its forces to try to prevent it. And that's where you come in. One of the reasons why the bill came as, as far as it did and uh, almost made it through was because of the work that you did. And I know that uh, during the debates because I was a sponsor and I spoke to many uh, of the senators. I know that they were significantly influenced by the, uh, the mail that they received from uh, religious communities and from churches and congregations. People from their own churches were writing to them and telling them that they needed to get this bill through the 262. And we need to do that kind of thing again. So. Um, I didn't mean to take up all that much time to, to talk about that, but it, it is an important bill. It, it's important, not just for the, the content of it, but it's also important as a, as a uh, reflection of what it is that Canada now says it truly stands for. And if it doesn't pass, then that does not bode well for the future of reconciliation and the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people in the government of Canada going forward. So I thank you for the time to, to address you. I'll now hand it back to, um, to Jennifer. So I'm to take it on now. Yeah, thank Marie. you so much. Thank you for those words. Yeah, we were watching, we are carefully watching your work in the Senate when you were there. And at that time I was working with Romeo Saganash and meeting with senators. And uh, it, was a, it was a very, very bitter day um, uh, when, uh, when the shenanigans um, by a handful of senators uh, brought that to an uh, end, um, that's for sure. So now I'm going to hand the mic to Marie. Um, uh, Marie, for your thoughts, please. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And um, I just, um, if I, I may, I'd like to just begin uh, by saying in my own words, uh, to give thanks for the gift of life and the gift of this day and the grace that has brought us all safely to it. I, I want to say thank you to, uh, to Jody and to Shannon for their words of invocation and um, a special thank you to you Jennifer, for, for pulling us all together. Um, if I may, I want to say hello to my fellow commissioners as well, because you may think we get together like the old gang often, and in fact, it's extremely rare. Um, we have um, all remained busy in various ways since the commission, but it is um, a gift to be able to uh, share space with my fellow commissioners, so I'm really glad to be here with them. Um, they've between the two of them, they've covered a lot of ground, and I want to try not to be um, um, too repetitive on some of the main points. I'm also aware of time, but I, I want to lift up um, a couple of specific issues um, to your question, to the heart of the question, which is uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
and uh, Bill C-15. In other words, the relationship between the two and how the two fit together, if I may just say a couple of words about that. Um, and to do that, I want to, I, I never want to make the mistake of assuming everybody on this call or in any form I'm in remembers um, all of the key elements of our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I always go back to um, some of the foundational points th that are so important. And that is that we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada because residential school survivors made it happen. It wasn't politicians who made it happen. It wasn't legislators who made it happen. It was the survivors of uh, the residential schools that carried on in Canada for over 150 years, who went to court and took on the government and the faith communities, the churches named who ran those residential schools for more than a century um, and argued that what had happened to them as children was wrong. Now you may know all of that general information but it is extraordinary that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, was court supervised and came about not because of government, but in spite of government, uh, not because of churches in some uh, examples, uh, but in spite of churches. Um, and so the question about the relationship between the TRC and the UN Declaration um, also then um, becomes a, uh, a question about the relationship between both of those instruments and faith communities. And I was trying to think about how to say it in kind of the, the, the most um, stripped down way when I was trying to contemplate how we would talk about such big topics in such a short amount of time today. Um, and, and I was thinking that if you look at the UN declaration and the good and helpful wording that is in there and some of it in the preamble and some of it in, in the final clauses, it talks about the UN Declaration as being a minimum standard. It doesn't say uh, we're asking for a whole bunch of new things and we're gonna have special deals that are better for indigenous people than for anybody or everybody else. It says these are minimum standards. And, and by the way, nothing here um, takes away anything from anybody else or, uh, or excludes indigenous people from those um, rights and protections, um, including international instruments. Um, that are already in place um, for um, the rest of the world's population. So it's, it's not an exceptional thing. It's an acknowledgement, if you will, of what has not been in place. Um, and uh, our chair, um, Justice Sinclair, then Senator Sinclair, and maybe we now have to say Chancellor Sinclair, uh, pointed to that when he talked about those things that need to be corrected that are still on the books um, in, in our country. Uh, I know this is an international conversation, so I know that what we say here often is of relevance as people look at the situation in their, in their home country as well, in the United States, particularly in this North American dialogue. So if you think about the UN Declaration as being the articulation of how things should be and should have been all along, let's call it for what it is, but how things should be, and it's a minimum standard, then what is the TRC and our work and our report? It is an articulation of the kind of societal mess you can get yourself into and the havoc you can wreak when you ignore all of those things, when you ignore those things that are um, embedded in the heart of what the UN Declaration is trying to tell us. And so, uh, then where um, the story of the TRC, if you think about the articles in the UN Declaration that talk about uh, the right to, for children to be raised in their own culture, uh, for children to learn in their own language, the right for people not to be displaced or removed by another people, the right for people to know and have access to their land, the right for people to be able to exp express and practice their spirituality in their own ways. Um, the right to um, have spiritual and sacred regard over your own um, deceased members and, and ancestors and to have um, holding, um, and, and I say that in a, in a spiritual way, um, over um, their passing and, and the sacred rights um, that are their due and the the ways in which they are remembered and consecrated and commemorated, 
all of those things in the very single example of residential schools um, were all missing by repeated multiple examples of kids being taken away from home, removed from lands, dislocated, no sense of belonging, no sense of identity, knowing where they fit in. We heard that over and over again. And, and my colleague, uh, Chief Littlechild, talked about uh, the 7,000 people who spoke to us. There were recurring themes in there. And, and one of the, the dire ones was not knowing who I was or where I belonged and not feeling that anybody loved me. Um, and so not knowing where to fit in, not at home, where you no longer had the skills, the knowledge, the language, and the relationships that define belonging, and not in whatever other world you're supposed to now fit into as an assimilated person where racism took over. So we have um, a case study, if you can put it in that crass way, through the TRC, of uh, what all can go haywire and be, be wrong and have lasting life and death devastating consequences when you run roughshod over principles that we say in the world sphere and in the international sphere um, are the minimum standards of decency, social and human rights justice uh, that we should be holding ourselves to. So now where do the faith communities fit into all that? And I, I want to say and I want to honor and acknowledge uh, not only the decades of work that uh, Jennifer specifically has devoted to this and her own expertise in the field, um, but also this forum and the very fact that it is an ecumenical coalition. Do you realize in the time of the residential schools, that in itself would have been heresy. We heard stories of children who were in uh, same communities but from different faith traditions where they had supervised opportunities in the recesses to throw rocks at each other between Anglicans and Catholics, um, where children were told that the other group were going to hell and, and where the division between um, faith practices and faith variations um, were used as wedges and were used as uh, judgment sticks um, and were used to terrorize kids um, into being good enough or not good enough or part of or excluded from. Um, and most devastating of all, uh, the huge wedge that it created between themselves and their own families and their parents, um, where very often, as, as we heard over and over again, children came to hate their own parents or to be ashamed of them or to be embarrassed about them because of, often, because of their spiritual practices and traditions. And, and I won't get into the details of some examples that are very top of mind for me, they, they travel in my heart daily um, because I, I know these things can be very triggering for some of the people on the call. And I want to, uh, uh, Murray has acknowledged all the survivors who spoke to us and many have passed on, but I want to, um, I want to guess that there may well be survivors on this call with us today. And I want to acknowledge all of you and the intergenerational survivors because this is not a yesterday issue. This is a today issue and it's in our midst. Um, I, want to, um, I want to move forward to the point, not just of the passage of the bill, and I don't presume for a second to be the expert on the bill. I know what it's setting out to do. I don't have the, uh, the legal expertise of, of my colleagues, of, of Mary and Willie, but I, uh, I absolutely understand the point of it and, um, and the purpose. But I do know that it isn't just about and for governments. I know that it is absolutely, as all laws, laws are, but we tend not to think of them that way, as the, uh, the standards for our own living and being in our own relationships. So when we talk about reconciliation and, and the UN declaration as being the first principle of the 10 principles that we described, you know, you feature, you collectively as faith communities feature in the very second sentence of um, our little booklet here that, that marries and combines um, the 10 principles of reconciliation, the 94 calls to action of the TRC and the articles, um, the 45 articles of the UN declaration. And it says here, a reconciliation framework is one in which Canada's political and legal systems, educational and religious institutions, you're specifically named, corporate sector and civil society. There you're also named because we are also, all of us aren't we, part of civil society. We function 
in ways that are consistent with the UN declaration. So that can be lobbying um, our politicians and our elected leaders, and that's extremely important, it's been already noted. But it also has to do with how we function within our faith communities, those of us who have uh, a faith community that we are attached to, whether it's a formal religious institution or other ways. And one of the things that is articulated in the UN Declaration and several times um, in the TRC Calls to Action is that point, because we heard a lot about uh, physical abuse in residential schools. We heard a lot about sexual abuse, psychological and emotional abuse. We also heard a lot about spiritual abuse, spiritual abuse. And Article 12 says Indigenous peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies. The right to maintain, protect, and have access um, in privacy to their religious and cultural sites. Uh, the right to the use and control of their ceremonial objects. Well, when we think about the laws that have been on the books in this country and others, the confiscation of sacred objects, the denial of um, traditional spiritual practices, um, and indeed the shaming um, for those practices that was absolutely um, standard. That was a standard um, in the residential school context. So we have to think about that as well. It isn't just about the politicians, um, the laws they pass, do they have the political courage or not, but what also is the moral courage and the sacred responsibility. We always refer to our work at the commission as a sacred trust. What is that part of our collective work that is, uh, that is sacred and that allows for um, the, the, the reclaiming, the uplifting, um, the understanding um, and the practice of, of sacred um, ways of being in traditions um, that were not the ones running the residential schools. So I'll just leave my remarks at that for now. I'm, I'm, hopefully we can get back into uh, more questions from you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, thanks to all three of you. And I, I just want to say to folks at home that you think when you're on Zoom that everybody's in their living room and that means it's easy that you're not running a technical show. Well, that's a lie. And we did have a big technical glitch going on and we managed to get it solved without losing everyone or losing any of our uh, speakers. So yay for us. Um, okay, so we did want to, uh, we do wanna go a little bit deeper um, into this and I really appreciate all the comments that all of you have shared with us. And particularly, I think, you know, hearing a little bit, um, it's always good to know a little bit more about the inside workings of a parliamentary process, which for so many of us, that remains somewhat of a mystery. And I think that uh, because we did, we did decide that it, it wasn't possible for us to leave the Q&A open in the chat with hundreds of people signed on, but my colleagues in our coalition um, had given me some questions. And so I'm going to share some of the in advance. Um, and I, I'm actually happy to also note that between the three of you in your presentations, you actually covered uh, several of their questions. Um, but I am going to share some of the questions that my colleagues had given to me in advance. And um, uh, the one, I, and I think this actually builds on um, uh, a few, these are a few questions that will build on each other. So I'm actually going to lump them together because I think that may be easier. And then we can go for, um, for back to the three of you for a round of answering. And so one of my questions, Joe Gunn, who is uh, the executive director at the Center Oblate, uh, a voice for justice. Um, Joe is wondering what's going to happen if we lose C-15? What's going to happen if C-15 doesn't go through? And how difficult is it going to be um, to be moving forward in reconciliation if that were to happen? And then uh, my colleague, uh, colleague Steve Heinrichs from the Mennonite Church of Canada is also asking about well, we all know that what happened to 262, and it's also a little bit creepy, frankly, this isn't part of his question, um, that we are in exactly the same part of the calendar in, in that 262 was in the Senate at this time of year, and we are going into June, and we are going into the potential of a fall election. So that is a little bit of an eerie um, similarity. And so what needs to happen, Steve's question is, what needs to happen now at the Senate to make sure that we don't hit that repeat? And how can Canadians help to ensure 
that we don't have that happen again. And then I just, a third one that I just wanna lump all of these three together is from my colleague, Catherine Sisk from the Presbyterian Church in Canada. And Catherine asks that some settlers are a bit paralyzed about how they do the right thing here. And what's your word to us um, and, and about our action around C15. So I'm, I'm just giving you that as a bit of a bundle. Um, and uh, uh, we'd be really happy to hear from all of you on your thoughts on, on that. So um, I guess we could go in the same order we went in the first round. Chief Little Child, you're on mute, so I'll have to get you to unmute yourself before you speak. But um, uh, you're welcome to begin or hand the mic to a colleague your choice. Yeah, I'll begin with one of the with one of the questions I heard, <clears throat> and that was to to ask what needs to happen. Well, I think that's obvious that what needs to happen, as far as I'm concerned, is for the senators to um, hear both sides of the issue. Because I say that because one of the stumbling blocks, um, a phony one, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, is free prior and informed consent. So in order to have informed opportunity, you have to hear both sides. And I hope, and I'm sure the senators will hear both sides. And then having heard both sides make a decision that's the right decision. And the right decision, as far as I'm concerned, is this is about our survival, our dignity, and our well being. And it's not a time to be playing with our lives. It's not a time to be playing partisan politics. I think it's a time to advance reconciliation and send the bill back. Uh, for final adoption so that we can get about our work. This is not the end of it. When it's passed and adopted is only the beginning of our work, as far as I can see in terms of reconciliation. So that would be my opening thought. And finally, personally, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter what they do. You can block it, turn it away, refuse it, don't acknowledge us as human beings. Go ahead and do that. But we, in my community at least, are gonna keep using the UN Declaration. We've been using it since 2007 when it was adopted and we'll continue to use it uh, in our daily lives. So, but I hope that the Senate would see um, that it's important that those recognitions be acknowledged. At least my elders, when I asked them, what did you want years ago? They only said three words. All we want is recognition, respect, and justice. And that's what I asked the senators to do. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Former Senator, what's your word to us about what the what needs to happen for the Senate to do its job? Uh, well, I, I missed your first question, so I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, I came in late, and uh, uh, but um, that I, that I really think is the big uh, the big question: what needs to happen, and and what can the members of this uh, of the faith communities, and in particular those on this call do to uh, contribute to that. Um, what needs to happen essentially is that um, uh, in order for the bill to become law, and, and, and if the bill becomes law, all it's going to do is require the government to do an analysis of its legislation. So it's a li very limited piece of legislation. It is not uh, a law that simply that is going to, in fact, enact the UN, UN Declaration as the law of Canada. It's not going to do that. It is going to say that uh, we have to analyze our laws to make sure that it's in compliance with the uh, legislation, uh, with the UN Declaration, rather. 
And if it isn't, then how do we change those laws to bring it into compliance? So it's a relatively straightforward piece of legislation. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the question of uh, how can uh, members of the community contribute to the passage of the legislation, it really is to communicate to the senators directly, as you did last time, one by one, communicate to them directly uh, in correspondence through emails, through direct mail, uh, through telephone calls, uh, to tell them that they need to pass this bill uh, for no other reason than the, sim the symbolism of it, the fact that, that this would be an indication that Canada is taking the UN Declaration seriously and Canada will honor the time requirements set out in this bill to do the analysis and report back to the, to the uh, joint houses. Um, and and that's, that is important uh, because, as I said, without the bill, it took Canada seven years almost six years to get to this point now where they're just putting a bill in place that says uh, we will do an analysis. Um, they should have been doing an analysis right from day one, but they didn't. And, uh, and if there had been legislation in place, they would have had to do the analysis, but uh, this bill will make them do the analysis. And I think that's an important step. And so uh, I would say uh, get, get the, um, the senators to recognize that they, it has limited implications in law, but it's an important step to require the government to do that analysis and, and get the report back to the to the joint houses and also to the public to talk about the laws that need to be changed. Um, so I think it's important for that reason. And so my advice for action is do what you did last time because it was very effective. And the only reason it got stopped was because the conservative opposition had rules in their favor and they don't have those rules in their favor at this time. <clears throat> but you also need to correspond with government senators, representatives of the government in the Senate um, and say to them, um, you need to ensure that you use the authority of the government to push this through as a government bill because it is a government bill. And that's the difference. Okay, thank you. And, and Marie? Well, uh, my colleagues have given uh, good answers. I, I just want to remind us, I, I, I remember there being a time, and more than one actually, uh, during the commission, where you've worked so hard at something and for so long, and um, tough, tough work, uh, emotionally tough work. And, and, and I remember there being times, sometimes me on my own and sometimes us together saying, you know, what if we do all this and nothing changes, you know? And I know for me, I came to a place of peace of thinking, no matter what happens, those people who have been involved in this work have been transformed by the experience of doing the work and that is not going to go away. And so um, I agree with uh, Chief Littlechild in that way that says, uh, as my kids used to like to say, you're not the boss of me. Um, the government is not the boss of us. The government is meant to be the servant of us. And we need to play our role in insisting, but we also have to not allow whatever the government does to limit our own ability to use and apply those things that are there for us that are the standards that we say we believe in um, and that define us, that define our, our code. Um, so, I would say first, I would say uh, absolutely, um, it needs to be framed as a nonpartisan issue. It's probably worthwhile to remind people, um, you know, of uh, the apologies. That seems like so long ago, but we've now got a whole new cast of characters, probably a bunch of them sitting in Ottawa who were not around when those apologies happened, and need to be reminded that it wasn't just. A government apology. It was, an it was an apology. There were several of them and they were offered by every political party and they all made pledges going forward um, to the big work of reconciliation, each in their own way, but with very beautiful language actually. And I think people need to be reminded of that. There's not a sitting leader of any 
National Party in Ottawa right now who was uh, the leader of the party when those apologies were offered and yet they stand. So I think that needs to be uh, recalled. Um, and I think we have to keep educating the younger ones, whether politicians or otherwise about that. And, and the, finally, I would just say, um, uh, you know, um, survivors didn't do it and we can't either. Don't get sick of it. We can't afford to get sick of it. We just have to keep working away in the ways that we can. Um, and uh, as, uh, as um, Chancellor Sinclair has said, uh, um, what you did last time worked, do more of that. Yeah, don't get sick of it, keep at it and, and make the circles bigger. Make the circles bigger and make the voices louder. May I make one more comment? I think it's very, it's important to keep this in mind. Um, when we were writing the uh, report, we, we had several meetings uh, uh, on writing the report and content and making changes and directing that uh, certain things be uh, further analyzed. Um, I remember sitting at a, an editorial meeting that we had, and uh, I think, I hope my colleagues will remember this, but one of the questions that uh, we were asked uh, and, and we discussed was, who is this report for? Who is this report for? And my response at that time, um, I think caught on with everybody, my response at that time was, the purpose of this report is to arm the reasonable to arm the reasonable people of society so that when they are in discussions with other people in society who are opposed to what is um, being said, what is being called upon uh, to do, that uh, they will have at their disposal all of the information they need and the arguments that they will need. So in the report, or any, any response to any Every response to anything that is said in opposition to the uh, adoption of the uh, UN Declaration. Thank you. And your comments uh, lead me to, I'm going to have one um, final uh, set of short questions for each of you to go around. Um, we promise not to keep you all night. Um, but I have a couple of questions that come out of your comments and also um, uh, speak to the big picture here of your work uh, as in the, in the commission, as well as the work that we are doing now. And one of the things that I would just, you know, and I, I appreciate very much, Marie, the comment that you made that, you know, there wouldn't have been an ecumenical coalition at, at a certain point in time. And I would say it is absolutely your work that brought us together. You know, it is the work of the TRC that brought this ecumenical coalition into being. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, I don't need to remind you, but for, uh, for everyone listening um, that isn't aware of this, in the 94 calls to action, one of them had a deadline. And that call to action was to faith communities. And we were asked to ensure that we adopted or endorsed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and as faith communities. And I think that while there were some uh, faith communities that already were engaged with the declaration and, and with that work, there were, there were some that were not. And it was your work that brought them here. So in truth, um, you have called us to this work uh, and, and we are doing this as an ecumenical coalition as an output of, of the calls to action. And I think that, uh, one of the things that I, I just wanted to ask you all to comment on is speaking to that call, speaking to, you know, calling the faith communities to account where the UN Declaration is concerned. And then also something that Marie spoke about earlier, uh, which ties into the role of faith communities in respecting the UN Declaration. What is the role of churches in ensuring that Indigenous people's rights to spirituality are being respected as affirmed in Article 12 of the UN Declaration, and especially when it comes to healing. So maybe just knowing that we're going to soon be coming to the end of our evening, if you wanted to respond to those questions and also uh, 
If you had a final thought you wanted to leave people with, this is probably a good time to do all of that. And we can go around the circle one last time. So uh, first, uh, Chief Little Child, I'm gonna um, call on you. Well, I'll start with your um, calls to the faith groups. Uh, and there was one with a time limit. Uh, that one with a time limit has not happened yet. And we're not giving up. We're still working on it. And that is the one that says to call on the Pope to come to Canada to apologize to the survivors. Because many, many times through tears and sometimes anger, we heard all I want to hear is three words. I am sorry. That's all I want to hear from the Pope and I'll be on my healing journey. So that's one. I've had three audiences now and I'm still working on it to, to, to happen. But I want to go back to your first question. The initial question about uh, the link between our work the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action with the UN Declaration being our first principle of reconciliation. There are, as you know, 16 references to reconciliation in the UN Declaration. And in Bill C-15, there are nine references to reconciliation. That's why I say this is all the way through. That's the common thread that calls on us to work together in this with these um, experiences we've had with the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the UN Declaration, and now C-15. That's the one call that's common to all of them. That, that is that we need to work together. It's going to take all of us to have true reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to respond to the second of those questions uh, uh, because I think it's an important question. Um, and that question, as I understood it, was what's the role of the faith communities to assist Indigenous communities to um, to revive their own faith? And um, <clears throat> I, I just want to share a little, a little story with you. And it is this. Uh, I've been to many ceremonies with many elders over the years and traditional ceremonies involving their own teachings and, and uh, reflections of cultural uh, understandings. Uh, and I've often said that one of the important uh, responsibilities, every important um, areas of uh, learning for Indigenous youth is to understand where you came from and understand what your um, what your role in life is, and you, you learn that from your teachings. You learn that from the culture of your, of your people, and that makes you feel valid. Uh, but um, in one session, I can distinctly remember uh, listening, and I was I was kind of really overwhelmed by this very simple teaching that this uh, elder gave, in which he talked about because he was asked a question, and the question was. Um, why do they hate us so much? Why do, why do Christians hate us so much? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he got up and he spoke and he said, they don't. Actually, they don't. He said, uh, because, you know, he said, if Jesus were to walk into this lodge right now, he would sit by the fire with us. He would join with us because he knows that we believe in the creator. He knows that we believe in his father. And so he would be here with us and he would uh, honor us and he would show his respect for us in that way. And so uh, I was really struck by that at the time. And that was years ago, even before my son was born. And, um, and I thought that's a very powerful understanding of things. And so in answer to the question that you're asking, uh, what is the role of faith communities to assist indigenous communities in their own recovery of faith. It is respect. That was the uh, a key element of our own work, and that is respect. Um, and so people need to understand and learn what respect really is about. 
It's not tolerance. It's not simply um, saying you go ahead and do what you want and we won't get in the way anymore. Respect is to understand and to accept the validity of it and to embrace the people who are living in accordance with that style of life of living. Um, so learn what the meaning of respect really is and then live a respectful life. And that will be um, what will help indigenous uh, communities to recover their own faith path. Thank you. Thank you. And Marie? Well, I'm going to be um, quite specific about it, actually, in referencing our, our, our TRC calls to action, because the one you're referring to, I think, Jennifer, with the deadline as it relates to the faith communities is number 48. And um, I'll, I'll read the key section of that, but, but I just want to preface it by saying, because I know um, in the Quaker tradition, the Mennonites, and some of the other faith traditions you've referenced who are on this call and in the coalition, um, many of those are not so-called uh, parties to the settlement agreement. And that was the, the big court case um, that led to the creation of RTRC, as, as, as most of you know. Um, but over the course of our work, one of the things, one of the beautiful things that unfolded actually, was this growing number of, I'll say non-Indigenous, I'll describe it that way, of non-Indigenous people who came out, especially to our national events. Um, uh, I, was, I was equipped journalistically and skeptically to think there would be a lot of interest at first and that it would peter out, the story would die down and so on. And what we found, um, I, I'm sure based in almost complete part to the power and the, uh, um, the force um, and the courage of the survivors' own voices, um, we had more and more and more people come out as we continued our work. And, um, and many of those people were from faith communities that were not, who did, had not run residential schools, who were not parties to the uh, settlement agreement, and yet who stepped forward and said, uh, we have nonetheless inherited the benefits of colonization. Uh, we have ownership in the ongoing work of reconciliation. What can we do? So we were particular in including other faith communities in certain ones of the calls to action. And I want to reference 48, which specifically says, we call upon the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faith groups and interfaith social justice groups who have not already done so to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, and standards of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as a framework for reconciliation. So to see that as a framework. Um, and then um, it goes on in a number of the some clauses, but it says to issue a statement no later than, and this is the deadline some of you may have missed, um, 31st of March, 2016. So one year after our commission wrapped up um, from these faith groups as to how they will implement the UN Declaration. So to do it and then to declare publicly uh, how you're gonna do it. So that's the one big one where maybe there's still unfinished work there. The other big one though is number 60 and it, it addresses your second question um, in a tangible way, not necessarily an exhaustive way, but it gives some starting points. And it says, we call upon leaders of the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faiths in collaboration with indigenous spiritual leaders, survivors, schools of theology, seminaries, and other religious training centers to develop and teach curriculum for all student clergy and all clergy and staff who work in Aboriginal communities. And this is what it's supposed to be about on the need to respect Indigenous spirituality in its own right, the history and legacy of the schools, the roles of the church parties in that system, the history and legacy of religious conflict in Aboriginal families and communities, and the responsibility that churches have to mitigate such conflicts and prevent spiritual violence. So I talked before about spiritual abuses, and this talks about the spiritual violence uh, that, that that is part of. Um, and it, 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 
it, um, that, that piece belongs uh, to all the faith communities. Um, I, I wanna leave a last thought on this big issue with some of the very simple and beautiful, I will say encouragement and spiritual guidance that we received along the way from so many um, elders uh, on our journey. And I remember one in particular at our final national event um, and I've quoted him many times and he said, um, in, it, it was at a ceremony, um, a um, pipe ceremony to which uh, everyone had, had, had been invited in. And he said, um, lucky for us, creator speaks many languages and lucky for us, there's no wrong way to pray. Um, and I think it speaks to the heart and the purpose of ecumenical um, uh, coming together um, and um, collaborative efforts to find our way forward um, as a sacred trust, um, a, as a sacred pledge. And uh, so that's what I think about those issues and why I'm so grateful that you've convened us to think about these issues with you all together. That's awesome. Um, excellent. Well, well, as we're getting, we're getting close to our, the end of our evening together, and I know, and this is actually something we've already talked about, so I hope we haven't preempted ourselves on our agenda, um, but I'm going to call on my friend and colleague, Steve Heinrich uh, from Mennonite Church Canada. And Steve is going to briefly speak to a call to action and next steps. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer, and good evening, friends. What a powerful discussion we've been gifted with tonight. So good and so important. Through the commissioners, we have heard how Bill C-15 is an integral step that the government of Canada needs to take in order to live into truth and reconciliation. But the government needs our help and our strong encouragement to act to make this declaration legislation a reality. So tonight we are asking each and every one of you who are gathered here to send a letter to the Senate to call on the upper house to send C-15 through to its completion, to expedite its passage. The Faith in the Declaration Coalition has crafted a letter that you can all send to the Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples. My colleague Jonathan has put the link to that letter in the chat and on the screen. So what you can do right now is you can click on that link or copy it into your web browser and that will direct you to the Faith in the Declaration site where you will see the words, write an email to Senator Dan Christmas. Now it's pretty straightforward from there. Just click on those words and you will be directed to the letter and given some easy steps that will enable you to share your voice and your call to action to the Senate. As has been mentioned this evening, two years ago, on Indigenous Peoples Day, we witnessed UN declara declaration legislation die in the Senate because there wasn't enough political will. So we, the people, need to give the Senate a whole lot of political will. So please take two or three minutes, even now, to write the Senate and to share this petition with your families, your friends, your church communities, your neighbors, Together, we can honor the Declaration. Together, we can honor the spirit and intent of the TRC and so help decolonize Canada. Thank you, friends. I'm now gonna invite my friend, Peter Notaboom, the General Secretary of the Canadian Council of Churches to share a few words. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you, Jennifer, for hosting and moderating the evening tonight and especially Thank you so much to the commissioners. Uh, I think you will always be commissioners in our mind. Um, Chief Wilton Littlechild, Walking Wolf, Chancellor, Senator, Commissioner Marie, and Marie Wilson, uh, Commissioner Marie Wilson, thank you so much for being with us. Actually for coming to visit us in our homes. I was thinking that um, listening to you speak and sharing your stories, that uh, it's such a privilege to be in the presence of great people in 
in my living room and in our home offices. And so just really grateful for, for your storytelling, for your convictions, uh, for your teachings, for your strength and courage. It's been a real inspiration to many of us. Thank you. I'm also really grateful to the Faith and De Declaration people, the folks who have the coalition that's brought this together, the coalition of Canadian faith houses and faith organizations who are working to support the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you too for, uh, for being together and to advocating together and working together on such an important topic. I'm also really pleased to thank the tech support folks who made this happen behind the scenes. Thank you, Jonathan and Carmen and all the others who are uh, working the technical side of things so that the Facebook live stream and this uh, Zoom recording all work well. And of course, the interpreters who made it accessible for us in both French and English, thank you. And finally, of course, all of you who joined. Uh, Thank you too for being in our living rooms so that we could see you, your, your names and your, your homes where you are and, 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 and seeing how this commitment to justice lives uh, in all of us. And so I hope and pray that together uh, we'll work together, that we'll pick up again the task of working for justice, unity and reconciliation once again. Thank you. And back to you, Jennifer. And I believe you're muted, Jennifer. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, and uh, just to add to uh, Peter's thanks, we've had a small steering committee that uh, made this evening happen. Um, Jonathan Schmidt with the Canadian Council of Churches and Steve Heinrichs with the Mennonites and Catherine Sisk with the Presbyterian Church in Canada and Joe Gunn. Uh, with the Center Oblate and uh, Kira Mann with the Quakers and myself. And so thanks to my colleagues in that steering committee. I especially need to thank, obviously, our three speakers. And, you know, I think that absolutely you're right. And I think that no matter what happens, um, uh, no matter what happens in the next few months, um, this work carries on and this work goes forward and none of it, uh, none of it is lessened. Um, but I would also say that the work that the three of you did in the TRC, you forever changed um, the face of this country that is now called Canada. Um, and, and you have forever changed the path of what this young country may yet to become. And we hope that we will see, uh, we will see a step in that change come uh, next month. Um, uh, and we pray that we will see that change come in the next month. Uh, but, but we, you know, our deepest gratitude and respect to the three of you for the path that you have brought us to. And Chancellor Sinclair, I'm going to end with some words that you made at the closing events of the TRC in June of 2015, when you said to the more than 1,000 people that were in that ballroom, in Ottawa, you said, you thought, if you thought that the truth was hard, reconciliation will be harder. And I think it's good for us to remember that this is not easy work before us, but it is important work and we're never to lose sight of how important it is. And so with that, I want to, on behalf of everyone in the Faith in the Declaration Coalition, extend our deepest gratitude to the three of you for joining us this evening um, and for sharing with so many people your wisdom and your thoughts uh, and, and your assistance to us as we go forward on that hard and important journey. And with that, I think our evening has come to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Masucho, thanks. Goodbye, my brothers. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you both. Uh, we'll talk again soon, I hope. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Bye, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> Bye, Bye, Jennifer. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.